Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mole Hill Mountain, episode 128. We are back. Andrew Eisen here, along with E. Zachary Knight. Hello, Zachary. Hello, Andrew. I notice that you're sick. Yeah. It's great to hear that. Airplanes are boxes of disease. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's right. You went to visit your sister. Huh? Yeah, I went to uh, St. Louis to visit my sister, and... I was on that disease trap of an airplane, and I got home, and it just killed me. So, um, hello, Matthew. I like Nier very much. I think you like it better than I do, but I did like it very much. <laughs> um, very good game, you know. Um, it really, uh, most of my complaints about the game are relatively minor. Uh, like... <laughs> Um, it's not a game I'm going to 100% because some of the things you need to do 200% are just needlessly time-consuming. Um, in fact, I'm kind of surprised I, I did the all uh, 60 side missions uh, because the last side mission, which I admit I had to look up what you had to do, is um, <laughs> there, there, there's two side missions that are a pain in the butt one of them is a guy uh, you, you basically have to fill out the bestiary so mm -hmm. when you when you come across uh, enemies if you give them a good smacking they're added to you know this is what this type of enemy is and um because I was the kind of player who, if the cute little robots weren't bothering me I didn't bother the cute little robots yeah um, it, that forced me to go kill a few things that I never bothered killing before because they never <laughs> bothered me. Uh, luckily, you only need like 90, 95%. Uh, you don't have to 100% the bestiary, so to speak. But some of the enemies only show up in certain chapters at certain places at certain times. So I had to go looking, I had to look up where some of these enemies were, um, which is kind of annoying uh yeah. but but the last quest i had to look up and it doesn't show up until you collect every weapon in the game and i had to look up where some of them were because some of them are just kind of randomly hidden like one that sticks yeah. out there. there's a sword that's just hidden in the desert somewhere and you have to use a special scanner and just kind of wander around and happen to be near it and the scanner goes boop 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 um yeah as so far as i know there is nothing that like there's no person in town who's like i hear tell of a sword buried in the sand near the rock that casts the shadow at noon you know no real hint that would put you in that area. It's just you'd have to stumble across it. Um, so that was kind of annoying. Yeah. Uh, not the biggest deal. These are minor complaints. Um, it stops me from 100%ing the game, but uh, I did get the, the main A through E endings and really quite enjoyed it. Although the game can be kind of a downer. Uh, it, it is definitely a story and mood that you have to be in the mood for because everything is hopeless. Everybody <laughs> dies. Everyone is miserable. <laughs> you know? And at some points it's like, yeah. oh God, this game is so depressing. Um, but uh, there are, I, I'm actually thinking about doing a video of, uh, you know, just little things about the game that I absolutely love. And, um, one of them would be uh, the writing uh, is re especially some of the menu descriptions. And I think my favorite are the um, fish descriptions because you can go fishing in this game because why the hell not? Um, <laughs> uh, and so I actually did spend a fair amount of time um, uh, fishing, trying to fill out my fishiary. Uh, because I, I found some of the descriptions for the fish just to be some of the funniest. And I don't have the game running right now. I, I'd read some to you. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the fishing thing is I, I had to look up some fishes and where they were. And they're like, the fish is here very rarely. 
And it's like, it would be the kind of thing where I'd spend 10 hours fishing to, to, to try and get, I'm like, okay, I, I, I don't need to do this. Um, yeah. But uh, there are so many wonderful little touches. I, I mean, the game is is good in and of itself, but there, there are just those little touches, uh, like the little floaty robot that, that floats by your head and shoots things. Mm-hmm. You can pet the robot. You can rub its little head. Give it a fist bump. Nice. I'm like, oh my god, that's the best thing ever. Um, there's also this weird thing where there's like these. There's three or four uh, hidden doors. Yeah. And um, uh, there's a robot saying, "There's nothing behind this door. Don't worry about it." And um, I thought, okay, well, maybe in another playthrough. No, couldn't figure out how to get through these doors. I looked it up, and online consensus seems to be it's just Yokotaro trolling us that there's nothing behind these doors. <laughs> and I'm actually not sure if I like that or not. There, there's a part of me that that's kind of amused by the troll, and there's a part yeah. of me that's kind of pissed off because I spent some time. Um, well, he's probably uh, figure that out. Yeah, he's probably just playing off the uh, the old video game trope of the the locked door. It's like, oh, this door's locked. I can't go in there. You know, where it's like you see all these doors. You're walking down. You're in a hotel, and you walk down all the the, the hallways. You see all the doors, but you can't open any of them because there are no doors to open. They're just they're just graphics on the wall, textures on the wall. So, but yeah. Did I kill Pascal or let him live? I removed it i wiped his memory um oh that, when you, when, when you a robot that's killing him technically. Yeah, well yeah um th- there is a point where a2 first meets him where you you have a choice kill pascal or don't and uh if you kill him that that gives you a game over um um, usually, I, I'm. I have a feeling that most of the when the game asks you, "Do you want to do this or this?" That's it. one of them is usually a game over. Um, uh, some of the game overs I got. I did remove my OS chip. I killed Pascal at one point. I also accidentally just walked out of a mission area at one point, and the game says B two wandered away and did her own thing, and the world ended. But hey, she was okay. <laughs> There's something like that. It's like B two <laughs> just said, "Screw it, I'm out." I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I didn't mean to. Oh, crap. <laughs> no, I got to do all of that area again. Go. Gotta, <clears throat> I got to go back to the... Um, um, uh, also, later, you can just leave the room, by the way, without wiping his mind. You can just walk out. Isn't it a, isn't it a binary? Ch- oh, it might be a don't and leave. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, I, I think I wiped his mind, uh, which is okay, because when you go back to his village... Um, he sells you stuff, so and it, it's like the the pieces of the people of his village. It's like I've got a bunch of robot arms and stuff. Do you want to buy them? I don't know what they're for. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, it's a it's a genuinely good game. I I really uh, quite enjoyed it, and I'm glad uh, uh, Square Enix put out a good demo for it because the advertising shirt certainly didn't sell me on it but the demo really did and um the game definitely stood up it's a, it's very unique uh it's a lot of fun uh again it, it it can be kind of a downer a very dour game at times very depressing so you, you kind of have to be in the mood for it yeah. um, it can be a little repetitive in places like the first and second playthrough um, are done from the point of view of two different characters, but those two characters are hanging out almost all the time. So you're going through the same scenarios, but you get enough of the other character plays differently enough and you get enough of new perspectives, I think to make it yeah. uh, worth that. Not just, Oh my God, I'm just doing the same thing again. Um, uh yeah. Also, uh, frame rate a little hitchy in places, but uh, um, overall, it's uh, the the main gameplay, the punchy smack robots around gameplay is solid. It's very fun. Uh, there's a lot of different weapons you can equip, um, and the weapon styles uh, ch- change change things up. Uh, change uh, completely change the animations. Uh, music is really really good. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. 
So, uh, uh, Matthew says also the game hints that it's not just the same, but a repeat of a cycle. Um, getting close to spoilers, I guess, but the game is a year old. So, um, yeah, the, the, any repetition you see uh, in the game, there is a story, there's a narrative reason for that, which is one of the interesting things um, about the game is that um, every mechanic um, is kind of justified and explained in universe. Yeah. Uh, to give you the lightest of examples, because I think experiencing it is part of the fun, is all of the elements of your HUD are little plug-in chips. Uh, so you collect little plug-in chips, and some boost your firepower, some will regenerate your health, some will give you new moves, things like that. But um, as we talked about earlier, you're, oh, you have a finite amount of memory, so you can only use so many plug-in chips. But uh, some of your memory is taken up by your operating system. But also all of the uh, you know the health display and the mini-map, those are plug-in chips, and you can plug them in and out too. So everything you see on the screen is actually part of your character's internal uh, uh, operating system uh, so cool. yeah so it, it's like oh uh, seeing a character you'll see games like um, I think Legend of Zelda does this where there's like an expert mode that gets rid of almost everything on the screen um, because it's like I'm a real adventurer I don't need to see a mini map that just takes me out of the experience well in Nier Automata there's a reason you can see a mini map because you have that chip plugged in, you know? Um, so, uh, so that's, um, some really, 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 uh, the witch time chip is OP. Yeah. The, uh, it's not called witch time, but it was very Bayonetta. Uh, basically there's a, if you dodge at the right time, it slows time. Um, uh, one chip that I plugged in and never looked back was a um, if you don't get hit for like six seconds, your health slowly starts rebuilding. And um, that was all I needed. <laughs> so, um, nice. hey, Suzanne. Yeah, anyway, uh, Nier Automata, uh, very good game. Uh, and a very a special game. It, it's very unique. Um, so I recommend it. Uh, right. now, now I'm playing Danganronpa, which is uh, kind of a visual novel game. Yeah. One of those, uh, kind of like uh, Battle Royale, where a bunch of kids in a, in a space and they all have to kill each other or they all die, kind of a thing. Fun. So. Yeah, see, I, I, got, uh, I got an NES classic. Well, it was a family gift uh, for <laughs> Christmas. And... and uh, really enjoying it uh, i've already added games to it uh i i stuffed it full uh, of of nes game boy and game boy color games uh and uh and i'm really liking that uh, my kids have been playing uh the pokemon games and uh having <laughs> my son is playing pokemon yellow and my daughter is playing pokemon crystal and uh and me i i'm there are Super I, NES versions of those games, or did you? Put no, them? Game Boy ones. Oh, yeah, you can load Game Boy games on there. You can load uh, just about. Yeah. Games well, I mean, there was a Game any, Boy. Uh, there was a Game Boy player for the Super NES, so it, yeah, it works. Well, yeah, but you you can you can load emulators for just about any system onto these things. Um, uh, some of the options that that are there, all the way up to uh, PlayStation One games. Uh, uh, through the, uh, the the mod tool that I used, and, uh, and it was, uh, so that was kind of neat. Uh, so I bounced around a bunch of games over the last couple of weeks, and uh, and I'm finally I finally settled down on to one specific game, and so uh, right now I'm playing Final Fantasy II, the original NES one. Uh, uh, is that the Japanese one or the, the English? The one? Japanese one. Okay. Uh, so. Um, I and, wish they had uh, subtitles so we could tell them apart. 
Yeah. I always have to ask the <laughs> well, Japanese or the North American. Yeah, I, I've gotten to the point where I just, uh, like, if I'm talking about Final Fantasy 2 or 3 on the Super Nintendo, I don't call them mm-hmm. that. I call them 4 and, and 6. Sure. Um, just, just so that, you know, there's less confusion. Um, but, you have decreed um, that we shall only refer to Final Fantasy games by their <laughs> Japanese numbers. Yeah. Um, so uh, Final Fantasy 2 is the only free PlayStation 2 Final Fantasy that I haven't played yet. Um, I've played all the other ones. Um, so I've played all the way up to 10-2. I haven't beaten 10-2 yet. Um, and I haven't beaten Final Fantasy 3 yet. I got Final Fantasy 3 on the Ouya, which is the uh, the mobile the mobile version of it. I guess it's also the DS one as well. I think it was on the DS, but, uh, um, but yeah, I played that all the way up to the last dungeon and then I got kind of tired because the last dungeon, it's like three hours of gameplay with no save points. And uh, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to deal with that right now. Um, but final fantasy two is very interesting. Um, and and it it's set apart by from all the rest of the Final Fantasy games because it uh, they they decided to try something different with uh, leveling instead of just fighting monsters, getting experience, and leveling up. You gain you you increase your abilities and certain attributes through specific actions that you take. So if you want to increase your sword prowess and your strength, you fight in battle with your with your sword. If you want to get better at using a spell, you use the spell and, and you get better at it. Um, but it has some weird issues, like if you want to get more HP, you have to take damage. And so um, I've been playing for about three hours now, and... I haven't gotten past the first area because I'm just sitting there having my characters beat each other up to, to get their HP up. Cause you start out with some crap that HP, the monsters in that area don't do much damage, but, but man, it's like you step outside of that first area and, and you'll get slaughtered. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get my characters HP up. I think most of them are, or the, the, first three characters are over uh 200 hp now which is which is good for early game but i want to get that up uh, uh pretty high and yeah it is kind of dumb i i i'm i i'm, I'm having fun um hacking it's not the right word exploiting it that's what it is um and there's a couple other exploits too that you can do like um and and this is one that I've I've I'm learning as I'm going is that uh, if you want to get better at using a specific weapon, like you, uh, every character can use every weapon in the game. They just they but everybody starts at a base level of one with that weapon. But the more you use it, the better you get, and the better you get, the more hits you can do, um, and and everything. But the game has so so the game but the game has a bug in its logic where you gain a point, a skill point in a weapon every time you, uh, every time you, uh, complete a fight command, like just the command, you don't actually have to complete the action, just the command. So you, you, you hit fight, you select an enemy, go to the next character, hit back to go back to that character, do it again. And there's cycle through like that, you know, a hundred times. And that levels up your weapon use uh, one time just from, you know, just in one battle. And uh, which is kind of funny, uh, which is pretty funny. And spells are the same way. You, uh, you select to use the spell, um, select the target, go to the next character, then go back and, and reselect. It's a little more time consuming with spells because you have to hit multiple menus and select the actual spell you want to power up. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's hilarious just how easy it is to exploit the system. Um, but the, the thing that's really bugging me though, uh, is that, uh, Gil is really hard to come by. Uh, the monsters in the first area you're in don't give you squat, but if you want, useful spells they cost like like say the the basic fire bolt and ice spells use uh are are 
they each cost 400 gil to buy and you want to buy at least one of each for your first character and uh and and that's 1200 gil but you're only getting like 10 gil at per battle 10 to 20 gil per battle and that's a lot of battles to go through so i'm trying to get powered up because there's a little a little spot at the bottom of of the land you're on for the first area that uh, has some tough monsters on that will give you a lot of money back if you can actually defeat them so i'm trying to trying to get to where i can actually fight them um Lugie says that he heard the the late game late game spells are awful i haven't uh, had a chance to to look at that but uh, from what i've read um if you exploit the the leveling up uh, bug for the f three basic spells that's pretty much all you're going to need the rest of the game like if you get those up to level five or six each you're you're set you don't need things like um, flare and and ultima and all that kind of stuff so but yeah i'm i'm uh having fun it, it's you know, it's a little bit of a chore and a grind, but I think it's a fun grind. It's not like it's not like where you get to a boss and you find out, oh, I'm like six levels below what I need to be to fight this boss. I'm gonna have to sit here and grind so that I can actually fight the boss that I already managed to get to at my current level. Now this is just, uh, ooh, let's see how how fast I can level up these things uh, or level up all these individual skills. And uh, yeah, so it's not too bad. The uh, so I, I do have some some really big complaints about this version of the game. This this is the NES version. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, and it's built on the exact same engine as the first Final Fantasy, and so it has um, it has that problem where if you select an enemy. Uh, to attack, but that enemy runs away or or dies by somebody else's attack before your character can uh, can uh, hit it. You basically swing at nothing, and uh, and that is that is pretty pretty <laughs> really stupid, and I hate it. Um, and the other issue is that my characters seem to have the ability to miss probably 40 percent of the time like literally they will miss 40 percent of the time and and i can't i can't it, it just drives me nuts it's like okay let's attack miss 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 it's like what is going on and it seems like if one person is going to miss everybody is going to miss including uh, the the monsters and uh, and it's just like I can't, I don't understand it. Um, I, I I know it's probably just just very very bad uh, random random uh, number generation there, but ah, uh, when when more than one character misses, it's it's insane. But yeah. Well, what's really funny is when you select a character and have them attack themselves because you're trying to build up their HP and they miss it's like yeah. you have your fist right here your face is right here How and you, you can't know. hit that <laughs> it's 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 like in um like games like XCOM where you're standing right next to the damn alien point blank and you have the your shotgun leveled at their face and it's like 95% and you still miss you're like how do you miss? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's hilarious. But I I'm enjoying it. I I like the game. It, it's got a so far the uh, I haven't haven't gotten progressed too far into the story, but uh, so far the story is a little a lot more entertaining than um, than Final Fantasy ones was. Because that one was just the there there was the bare minimum of a story. It's like, oh, go and rescue the princess, and then and then the game just kind of after you did that, the game just kind of let you go, and you just kind of randomly wandered into the rest of the game, and <laughs> and uh, this one this one it's it, there is actual story, and you they they have uh, the uh, they have a a keyword 
uh, feature in the game where if somebody says a keyword and it's in brackets, you can learn that keyword and and repeat it to other other characters and and uh, and gain more information that way. And that's a that's a fun feature. I like that. Uh, that's more role playing like than. Uh, one of my favorite um, improvement, upgrade, learning moves type of systems and games was from the uh, Hybrid Heaven on the N sixty four. This was a game um, where the when you got in fights with enemies, uh, you had to choose uh, which move you did mm -hmm. and uh, which limb you did it with. So you could do a you know a right hook or a left hook. Uh, you could do a right straight kick or a left straight kick, get head butt. Um, so I mean, you had jab, hook, uppercut, but but you but you could do that with your right or your left arm. You had yeah, various uh, front kick, side kick, roundhouse kick. You had to pick which leg. And um, the more you performed a particular move, the stronger that move would become but also the stronger that area of your body would be because yeah. you can attack certain points head legs arms and that will you can disable an arm and the enemy can do to you and you can't throw yeah. lefts anymore um but also uh so that's a neat system but on top of that uh you learn new moves in that game by having enemies uh perform them on you uh, so a lot of the, so a lot of the games you find a new enemy and you're like ooh and you just let them hit you um, <laughs> to see if they know anything yeah. new different grab you're like come on grapple me come on grapple me let let's see if you've got a new suplex or body slam or something like that and, uh, nice um, and uh, yeah it's a, it's a, I I played uh, the hybrid heaven for a few hours on uh, one of the extra live streams like four or five years ago so. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. Let us uh, let us move to topics. All right. Uh, so first topic. Uh, let's <coughs> let's talk about Bowsette. Uh, so new Super Mario Brothers U, uh, which is being ported to the Switch, yeah. uh, has a, has a few differences. Uh, one of them is that you can play as Toadette. And there's a new item called the Super Crown that when she collects it, she turns into Peachette. Yeah. So the internet thought, well, wait a minute. If Toadette turns into a Toad-influenced Peach, or a Toadette-influenced Peach, because she still has the braids and stuff, Yeah. what if Bowser got his hands on the uh, Super Crown? Would you have a <laughs> Bowsette? Would you have a Bowser influenced Peach, so a Peach with like a turtle shell and fangs and stuff. Um, now, one of the interesting things is this, uh, according to an art book, this actually was an idea that Nintendo had at one point. Um, although it was, uh, I, I think it was for Mario Odyssey. Um, uh, rather, so the, the hat thing rather than the. Um, uh, the the super crown, but uh, they had the idea of this Bowser influenced uh, a peach design, mm -hmm. and uh, so the 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 Nintendo website for the game New Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe uh, is up, and a lot of sites took note that the uh, description for the super crown reads: When Toadette finds one of these, uh, the super crown. She can transform into the super-powered Peachette. Parentheses. Sorry, Luigi. Only Toadette can use this item. <laughs> because there was a lot of things like, I wonder if anyone else in the game can... Uh, now, Bowser's not one of the playable characters in New Super Mario Brothers U, but yeah. uh, Mario, Toad, and Luigi are. So could they get a Super Crown? No. According to this... Uh, in uh, New Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe, only Toadette gets the Super Crown and can turn it. Yeah, into yeah. And from what I've read, uh, if any of the other characters t uh, grab it, they just get ten coins instead of uh, instead of any kind of power up. Mm. So. Well, uh, the point I want to bring up 
is I saw a lot of articles uh, talking about what what I ju what I just reported, if you want to call it that. And here's how the the, the article titles are written: <clears throat> Nintendo officially shoots down Bowsette. Bowsette is never going to happen, Nintendo says. Bowsette won't become official, according to Nintendo. Maybe I'm being picky, but that's bad head headline writing because that's <laughs> that's not the imp the best you can say is Bowsette is not in New Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe. That's <laughs> it. That's it. This wasn't an interview, and they're all citing this part of this the, yeah, the game uh, web page. Yeah, it's just they're just quoting that little blurb about how the power up works. Yeah, and that, that's it. Yeah, and but, and it, which is crazy. There's yeah, no official this... statement. Bowsette, you know, for all we know, Bowsette could be one of the upcoming DLC fighters in Smash Brothers. All yeah, yeah. See, this is a, an example. Or at least an of, alternate uh, costume. Yeah, but this is an example of of uh, the article body of one of these articles. It says now a week ahead of Switch Games launch, Nintendo has answered the question for us. There is no Bowsette. And then they quote that I, that blurb, um, and uh, and then that's it. It's like, okay, where does Nintendo that say that Bowsette will never happen? It it doesn't. They don't actually say that. And and yeah, that, uh, to me that is uh, that is clickbaity because uh, because you 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 see that and you see you see a headline bowser is never going to happen nintendo says yeah, you they think didn't that, say that, anything yeah you, you, you would think that there's best. actually a quote from a nintendo yeah. representative addressing the bowser uh, uh meme and no they they don't there's nothing in there about that um so yeah, I, I I'm not a big fan of these headlines. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. bad headline writing. Shame on you. Yes. But uh, the interesting thing about will Bowser ever show up in any form, like as a DLC fighter or a costume? Although I imagine y you can recolor the costumes and. Smash Brothers Ultimate, I'd be surprised if black wasn't one of the colors you could make Peach's dress in the game. Um, but I doubt she gets a turtle shell in the back, you know. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo, the popular uh, the popular design for Bowser is the, the black dress version with the kind of the spiky yellow hair. Um, yeah. Nintendo doesn't own that imagery, so they really could, they could use their own initial concept, which was I think red hair and and, and you know fangs, um, and I think she was wearing like a olive or green dress or something like that. Yeah. Um, they could go with that, but that's not the Bowsette imagery that people are familiar with. So it, it's kind of a it's kind of a difficult thing if Nintendo wanted to do something with Bowsette. Uh, what they could do, people wouldn't recognize and what people would recognize they really can't legally do so yeah 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 i'm just yeah okay so i'm looking at it uh, I, I had to look it up look up the uh the uh, from the mario and this is uh from the uh the mario odyssey, odyssey, odyssey book, right? art art book yeah right. and um and so there is a um, I guess this is a Bowser Bowser possessing Peach, um, and and so because he's throwing a hat at Peach and possesses her, and she's got the she's got the the bracers, a tail, green dress, red hair, fangs, red eyes, and mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like the turtle shell or at least shoulder spikes and horns yeah. uh, coming off her head, so. Yeah, that's Nintendo's official design. But <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Ronan says that with my voice, I should be a DJ for late night slow songs. Um, I have to speak in this range right now because I have no voice up here. <laughs> I can't speak any higher. So I have to speak in the bottom of my register right now because, <laughs> because I have no voice. Um, yeah. If I, if I try and go up and register, the voice just cracks and gets lost. So, 
Ronan right. says, I think as long as it was relatively recognizable, then people would be fine with it. I think so, too. Um, I mean, Nintendo sometimes is aware of things. Like, I mean, Nintendo was aware and had fun with the Luigi Death Stare. Uh, so, you yeah. know, you never know. Well, and they, they, yeah, the, the Luigi Death Stare. Yeah, I remember that one. That one was fun. But, and then Luigi actually dying. <laughs> In the in the introduction for for uh, Simon Belmont, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Poor Louis. So, speaking of Smash Brothers uh, DLC stuff, I saw a rumor. Or someone data mined and found um, what's possibly the encode code name for DLC characters, and uh, I was I'm. I always wonder, it's like, I mean, if it's supposed to be a secret, just just call it DLC Character 1, DLC Character 2. Stop giving them cute code names that people can decipher, you know? <laughs> well, and... and, uh... and instead of naming it DLC Character Joker, parentheses, Persona, just call it DLC 1, you know? I am. Yeah. I don't know. I, you only I, have I, yourself to blame because you know people are going to data mine this stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm a programmer and uh, and 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 it's taught or it's drilled into us. Like like we we have a you know our our teachers are over our shoulders with a with a yardstick, and if we type a var one, we get wrapped on Smack. the knuckles. You know. What and, uh, is var one? <laughs> <laughs> we will have no <laughs> ambiguous variable names. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so so the uh, the rumor is that uh, one of the five DLC characters that are one of the, the is there just there's four, four unrevealed. Uh, one of them is going to be a Dragon Quest character, which I'm fine with. Yeah, um, I think the code name was Brave. Yeah, people are meaning that to be Erdrick from uh, Dragon Warrior. That'd be cool. I'd be fine with that. Yeah, it could, could also be one of the bravely default cast. Yeah, I was thinking that myself. I was like, brave. That's bravely default there. Um, and, and that was actually uh... maybe it's Merida from the Pixar movie. <laughs> Yeah. No. When when I wrote uh, when I wrote my article talking about uh, you know when when Cloud was first revealed for uh, uh, Smash Wii U, mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, there's so many other Nint Square characters that Nintendo could have put in there. Why did H. they go with one that you know? And one my my one of my thoughts was a character H. from Bravely Pro. Default, <laughs> um, because you know that's an actual game on a Nintendo console, and it's one that just recently had just recently released they've got a, had a sequel on the way it's like you know what better way but uh i'm you fine know. with i'm fine with a a dragon quest game uh, character um i i would prefer taloon just because i want his final smash to be an army of merchants uh mm. raining raining a terror down upon all the rest of the smash characters but uh <laughs> <laughs> that, that was always, you know, that was the, he, Taloon was in my, in my final battle party in, in Dragon Warrior 4, mm. be, solely because of that. It's like, he, he was pretty much useless for anything else, but it's just like, I just loved it when that army of merchants came uh, marching in to help. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, I had something brilliant, and then I forgot what it was. Oh well. Uh, as long oh, as there's I, a slime, I, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah slime was, should be a an assist trophy. <laughs> I was going to say that. Um, well, I mean, now that we've seen that uh, slimes can do anything, thanks to the recent anime, uh, the my life as a reincarnated slime, or whatever it's called. Um, there's a lot of potential for slime fighter character. Um, but instead of Cloud, I would have gone for something a bit more nintendo and a bit more representative of the Final Fantasy series as a whole and just made Chocobo a fighter. I think that would have been a lot more fun. That would have been fun. Or a Moogle. Uh, or a Moogle. Of course, I go for Chocobo, but yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those, yeah. Yeah. Umaro. Go with Umaro. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right. 
switching topics here. Uh, let's do the. Uh... Oh, pardon. Ooh, bless you. Let's talk about. You can talk about public domain day because I need to give my voice a rest here for a minute. All right. Well, uh, so this past uh, January 1st, uh, just earlier this week, was Public Domain Day. And uh, and it is the first public domain day the U.S. has been able to celebrate since... Uh, I, I wrote in my article since 1978, but I think there might have been a public domain but somewhere between then and 1998. But I can't... I, I didn't have time to look that up. But... Um, but that's something, you know, uh, in 1978, uh, U.S. copyright law was expanded quite a bit. Uh, before 1978, copyrights were 56 years, um, and that was 28 years with the option to renew for another 28 years. Um, but in 1978, it was increased to the life of the author plus 50 years, and for corporations, I believe it was 75 years. Um, but in 1998, that was increased to life plus 70 and 95 years for corporations. And uh, basically, both, both of those uh, increases robbed the public domain of, of, um, of copyrighted works. Uh, we lost a lot of stuff uh, in 1978. Uh, some things uh, in the 1978 law, you had to have an active copyright at the time the law passed in order for, for you to actually gain from the extension. So like if you had a work that was 28 years uh, and you didn't renew it after the 28 years uh, b before 1978, then it went it actually went into the public domain. Um, one famous example of this is "It's a Wonderful Life," uh, the the famous Christmas movie. Um, the original production company only uh, didn't renew it in time uh, for the renew the the second half of the copyright in time, and so it actually went into the public domain. And so it was a big uh, flop before before it went into the public domain and then it became a, a huge success afterwards uh, because uh, television companies were free to to broadcast it around Christmas time and so they they broadcast it uh, you know to death and it became a, a Christmas tradition and but uh, so this year um, so so for the last uh, 20 to uh, 20 to 40 years, we haven't had a copy or haven't had a public domain day in the U.S. But today we or this week we did, and um, and so I wrote about it. Uh, and you know, I didn't write, I didn't do, you know, I, I don't do a whole lot. I just kind of um, I, I follow uh, the Duke Law School. Uh, every year they they publish their their public domain. Uh, um, review uh, and and so they pub you know the last few years they they've had lists of stuff that would have gone into the public domain if we still had uh, 1970 or pre 1978 copyrights um, but this year they actually published a, a whole bunch of stuff that actually went into the public domain this year and this is all works from 1923 uh, so that uh, that gives you an idea of <laughs> how long copyrights are. Um, nearly a hundred years later, we're finally getting these things entering the public domain, and and uh, there's some good stuff in there. But uh, so so uh, from movies, we've got the Ten Commandments uh, from uh, directed by Cecil de, uh, B. DeMille, uh, The Pilgrim. Uh, it's a Charlie Chaplin film. Uh, Our Hospitality, The Covered Wagon, Scar Scaramouche. Um, you know, and a few other things. And these are just an, uh, a sample. There's actually a, uh, they published a spreadsheet of just hundreds upon hundreds of works in different categories from film, books, television. Well, I guess probably not television. I don't know if television was a thing back then. Um, <clears throat> but uh, radio, music, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, some sample books that they they wrote were uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan and the Golden Lion. I don't know how many Tarzan books are left. Uh, I know there's a few Tarzan books, a few uh, uh, Princess of Mars books, and um, and then still some uh, Sherlock Holmes stuff, and a few things like that that are still 
that parts of them are still in the are still copyrighted, but other parts aren't. Um, but other books: Agatha Christie's *The Murder on the Links*, Winston Churchill's *The World Crisis*, Robert Frost's *New Hampshire*. That's uh, one that people are a lot of. I've read a lot of people are excited about. Um, and then music: we got the Charleston. We yes, we have no bananas. Um, that one's one I'm excited about just because I, I I do like that song. Yes, we have no bananas. Um, and uh, the Tin Roof Blues, and uh, and then some uh, sonatas and and other things. And and so this is uh, you know just you know, I find this personally fascinating. I, I like uh, I I like hearing about these things and uh, you know that all these things are now freely available to us and and this is just the um the entertainment side of things you know we're finally getting uh, some uh, uh scientific works as well that are finally entering the public domain and um and i don't uh you know i i don't know exactly how relevant uh, scientific uh, research is uh, uh, today, you know, stuff that was uh, performed back in 1923. Um, but it would it would be very interesting to have some public reviews of of that scientific research. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully uh, some good stuff will come out of this. Um, one of the things that uh, actually uh, caught my eye is that itch.io. Um, is running currently running a game a game jam uh, for the month of January to make games based on these public domain works that that were just released and uh, and they're they're actually going to be rewarding uh, prizes uh, for um, you know for for these things. Uh, you know, so some of the some of the categories they're going to be judging are best analog games, best digital game, best adaption of a 1923 work, best remixing of multiple sources, um, best deep cut, uh, and in parentheses they say use a work not listed on any of the roundup articles. Uh, so, so you know, stuff that uh, um, Duke Law School listed would uh, likely not qualify for a deep cut but uh, there's some really good uh, um, judges as well uh, Corey Doctorow uh, he's a he's an author uh, one that I've read a few a few of his things um, Dan Bull he's a, a, a singer from from uh, from England he does a lot of uh, a lot of video game related rap songs and and stuff so he's really cool um, Mike Masnick, he writes, he's the, uh, the owner and editor of uh, tech dirt. Um, and so, and then a few other, uh, a few other people that I can't recall who they are just off the top of my head, but, uh, but yeah, this is really cool. And, uh, they've already got two submissions. So, <laughs> um, we'll see if I actually get around to, to working on one, uh, this week or this month, but, uh, but yeah. But just like any other public domain uh, day, um, it, this is, uh, I wrote that this is a, a bittersweet moment for us because uh, while a lot of these works are coming in uh, into the public domain, the fact that these are works from 1923 and a lot of stuff from that era um, and from many years after are actually lost to us because the copyright owners didn't care about preservation or the copyright owner um, was unknown. And so people were afraid to touch it, to preserve it. And, uh, and so a lot of films are rotting books have fallen, you know, uh, you know, books have been forgotten and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. So we're, we're actually losing, we probably lost way, way more works than we're actually getting at this point. Uh, a lot of what we're getting are just gonna be the most popular things of that era, things that had staying power over time. Um, whereas things might've had more staying power had copyright not been so, so incredibly long. So going back to, um, Going back to It's a Wonderful Life, that film was a flop when it was released. Um, nobody cared about it. No, people didn't like it when it was first released. Um, had copyright been 95 years at the time, that film likely would have 
died and been lost to the public consciousness by now. Um, and so, you know, of course, like, you know, any other article I've written, I, I listed a bunch of video games that uh, would be entering the public domain had we had um, reasonable copyright. And, uh, and I was actually surprised uh, when I typed in uh, into Wikipedia um, 1962, because this is uh, 56 years ago in 1962, there were actually two games listed. And I was I was I was really surprised because I didn't expect to see anything uh, for 1962. But the but the very first video games ever were 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 written in 1952 or 1962. Space Wars and Marion Bad, and I wrote a little bit about each of those. Uh, um, but Space Wars is famously the first video game ever, and uh, um, but it's still under copyright. We are not allowed to. Uh, uh, copy or distribute uh, Space Wars. Um, I don't know anybody that has a mainframe computer that can run it, but uh, it's it's illegal to do so. Um, but uh, 28 years ago, some of the games that I, re I wrote down were Actraiser, one of my favorite Super Nintendo games, Dragon Quest IV, Gargoyles Quest, Mega Man 3, and uh, Fantasy Star Three Sim Earth Star Tropics, Yo Noid. <laughs> That's one that I I saw and I thought that was kind of neat. Um, so so those are games that would have entered the public domain had they uh, had a 28 year copyright term. And then 14 years ago, another list of great games: uh, uh, Blood Rain Two, Dragon Quest Eight, Jack Three, Kingdom Hearts, Chain of Memories. Um, Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, so we would have had two out of three Metroid Prime games uh, enter the public domain. Um, and uh, X-Men Legends, Zoo Tycoon 2, and WarioWare Twisted, so, uh, and, and tons and tons of others. Uh, and these, I, I just did a basic Wikipedia search, like, wi actually, Wikipedia has a list of games, like, if you uh, just type games released in, in 2004, there's an actual Wikipedia page that has every game that they know that was released in that year. And, and so that, that's, a, that's a really cool project that I, I really like that. So, but yeah, those are things that uh, we're not actually getting, but, um, but this is why I'm in favor of emulating old games. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I wrote uh, several years ago about how, modern copyright law is actually uh, robbing us of of video games uh, you know old video games because uh, you know I, I did a little bit of research uh, didn't go too in depth but basically what I did was I went and went to Wikipedia pulled the list of all NES games counted that up and then went to uh, Nintendo's official WiiWare uh, website for NES games and pulled up the number of games that they had for the NES on the WiiWare and uh, and and I did the same for Game Boy and Sega G did I do Sega Genesis um, I think I might have just stuck with Nintendo or I, I yeah I did things that were available on WiiWare I, I didn't focus on any other uh, stores or anything, but just what was available through Nintendo, and less than ten percent of games were were available on a modern console, and um, and uh, you know, and again, like something like the NES Classic with just thirty games on it from a library of over five hundred games, you know, we're missing out on a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, and and it's just and and all this is because copyright has out. Has, has outlasted um, the desire of the copyright holders to actually make those games available. And so um, black market or gray markets are the only way to actually get these games and, and play them in a modern setting. And, um, and, and yeah, it's a service issue and as well as a preservation one, uh, you know, they're the service, the official channels to get these games don't exist. And uh, and that's that's what sucks. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the that's the public domain. <laughs> you know, but you know, here's to having uh, stuff actually enter the public domain this year, and and hopefully, uh, Disney will keep its claws off of copyright mm -hmm. uh, over the next few years. There we go.
All right. Um, moving to a new topic. A uh, year and change ago, uh, Bethesda released a Fallout Shelter, which is a mobile game. And um, which is more in a year and lots of change ago. Uh, yeah. But uh, the game did, did pretty well. Uh, it was a uh, Made. It was a smash hit the the day it was announced because they were like, the game and is available still, right, right now. now, and that was actually a really cool reveal. I, I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and the game is actually fun. I've played it. Oh, I've uh, played it. Yeah. So yeah. So um, sometime after uh, Warner Brothers uh, partnered with the same developer of Fallout Shelter, Behavior Interactive, and made a Westworld game, and it's very very similar to Fallout Shelter in uh, both uh, design and aesthetics. So similar, in fact, that Bethesda sued them. Now, Bethesda and their parent company, Zenimax, is uh, uh, notoriously litigious over... It's like, hey, hey, here... We have the Elder Scrolls, (laughs) and you have (laughs) scrolls. So, uh, it's... So they sue over everything. But this one, actually, you look at it and you're like, that does look a little similar. And they also allege that some of the same code was used because an early bug in uh, Fallout Shelter, that same bug existed in uh, Westworld. Uh, so that was a big legal fight. Uh, that has now been res- oh, pardon me, resolved. And it has been re- resolved amicably. Uh, said Bethesda <laughs> in a statement. Uh, so all we know is that um, both sides have resolved the dispute and they are paying their own uh, legal court fee. costs and attorney fees. Uh, and the case is dismissed with prejudice, which means that uh, Bethesda can't uh, sue Warner Brothers for the same thing again. Yeah. So what exactly does that mean? Does uh, It could mean any number of things, I suppose. Uh, it, it, what sounds likely to me is that, um, I, I mean, you'd think if this, if this was a settlement that would have been noted, it, it wouldn't have specifically said they both paid their own costs and legal fees. Well, that could be it. You know, a settlement doesn't have to mean that somebody paid the other party. A settlement could just be a, they both agree that that the the fight isn't worth it and they're just going to stop. Um, you know, that that you know, um I, like, I think right, what, here's a, here's a buck. Yeah. I think what 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 we have here is a case of big fish tried to take on other big fish and realize that other big fish was willing to go the extra mile to make sure that uh, both big fishes realized they were big yeah. fishes and had the resources to fight this for years. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, instead of dumping millions of dollars into this, <laughs> just go home. Yeah, that that is my takeaway from this: is that that uh, Bethesda realized that they picked on the wrong crowd. I, I think uh, had a. Had it been just a small time developer or like or just the developer that made the game itself and they did and and there was no re you know there there was no Warner Brothers IP involved, mm. I think Bethesda would have would have went a lot further in in this legal battle. But because Warner Brother was involved and Warner Brothers is a lot bigger than Bethesda and, and Zenimax, that uh that they were just like, yeah, I think we bit off a little more than we could. Probably would have ended up some a battle of attrition here. Yeah, yeah, it would have been a uh, a lot of time and money just just sunk into court battles. I, I, you know, I don't think it ever would have gotten all the way to like a, the Supreme Court or anything, but it definitely would have made it to a, a, a federal appeals court uh, had had it went went uh, forward but but yeah it, it's it, i i think it was a a pretty tough um case for bethesda um you know they worked with a third party to make their game mm-hmm. you know that third party went worked with somebody else to make a very similar game yeah it's just like that's kind of what happens yeah. when you work with a third party yeah, it's, it's that, the same company obviously their work's gonna look similar <laughs> yeah especially when when 
you know, they're known for something popular like Fallout Shelter and somebody else comes along and has a very similar uh, or has Make a very something popular uh, like Fallout that. Shelter, but with our yeah. IP. All yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, you know, we got this IP. We really like this game that you made, and we think it's a good, you know, our IP is a good fit for that play style. Make something similar and get it out on the market. You know, yeah, a lot of the same thought process, a lot of the same um, technical uh, know-how is going to to work its way in. And uh, the developer, I really wish this article that I'm reading had that other developer in it, uh, the name of the other developer, but I can't. Oh, um, no, I'm, I'm not spotting the other. Are you name. talking about Behavior Interactive? Yeah, there we go. Behavior yeah. Interactive. I'm just, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm just kind of glossing over their name. Um, you know, uh, when, when this uh, lawsuit was initially brought forward, Behavior Interactive was like, you know, we had a, a base set of code that we had written before we had contracted with Bethesda. Um, and that stuff is not under contract is not part of the copyrighted works that bethesda is is allowed to use we can use this this other code and and this other code goes in is, is what we started westworld off of and um in the same way we started fallout shelter off of um but we aren't reusing any of fallout shelter specific code in the westworld game and you know, to me, I, 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 I felt that that was a very compelling defense and probably would have um, uh, probably would have swayed a jury or a judge in uh, in behavior and, and Warner Brothers favor, um, which could have also impacted this uh, this final settlement and why uh, they're both walking away. Um, so. Yeah, very, uh, very interesting case. Very, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't. We, I'm. It's just, it's not my business, but it is a curiosity that makes me. I want to know more. We're oh, never yeah. going to know more, but I'm yeah. like, I want to know what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and this happens a lot. Um, there's a lot of high profile lawsuits that that catch a lot of people's attention. And then they're settled out of court, and uh, or or settlements are sealed or whatever, and and it's just you know people want to know, but they can't. But the the parties signed a non disclosure agreement between each other about you know we're not going to tell you, you know neither one of us is allowed to talk about uh, what we agreed on, and and man is it frustrating. <laughs> Uh, I, I really like it when cases actually go to a public ruling and we actually get a public uh, uh, official document from from the courts about this is how things were decided. Um, those are a lot more fun, which is why I think a lot of people like it when are, are very interested. I, I can't really say like it, but are very interested when a case goes to the Supreme Court because they know that we're going to get a very in-depth review of the case and the thought process of, of the justices that, that eventually decide the outcome. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I think that will be our show for tonight. All right. Um, I would like to announce that uh, I have a, uh, video premiering tomorrow at uh, noon Pacific Standard Time. I'll put the link in the chat. There you go. Um, it's the uh, the great sibling gift exchange uh, the in the Santa Was Good to Me series. Uh, my sister and I uh, re exchanged our uh, Christmas gifts and recorded it. And um, I will say that my sister is now... She has now spent more on software for my Nintendo <laughs> Switch than I have. <laughs> so uh, so nice. there's that. So that video, it's about 20 minutes. It uh, premieres tomorrow at noon Pacific Standard Time. So if you would like to watch it with me, uh, the, the chat will be open. It's a it's one of the new um, newer uh, YouTube features, which I think is actually a good addition. I think that's kind of a clever idea, the whole uh, YouTube premiere. You can premiere your video and your viewers and 
uh, the producer can all watch it together. I think that's kind of a fun idea. Uh, so that's so that's tomorrow at uh, noon PST if uh, you're so inclined. Um, if you're not available and want to watch it, once it's premiered, it's live on my channel, so you, you can watch it anytime you want. So it's not if you don't see it at tomorrow at noon, you'll never see it now. It's, it'll be up on my channel tomorrow. Uh, so other than that, Andrew Eisen, c'est moi. Uh, e i s e n is how you spell the last name. Plug it into YouTube. You find the rest of my stuff uh, at Andrew Eisen on Twitter. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Zachary, plug away. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Easy Night, where I talk about gaming, politics, and other things that interest me. Uh, you can follow uh, my game development work at DK underscore Gaming uh, on Twitter and DivineNightGaming.com. And if you're interested in the Oklahoma game development scene, uh, check out OK Game Devs on Twitter and OKGameDev.com. All right. I must uh, go gargle and spit and disinfect. So um, I hope... Uh, Y'all have a lovely week. You've been listening to the 128th episode of Mole Hill Mountain, the podcast. So we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Right. See bye, you. Bye. bye.